questions the people on the talk. Now, I know some people are going to say, Max, maybe you get a pass because you're blind. And I've had that discussion. And I think that while there may be sometimes I get a little better result than other people would because they're blind, but instead I think it's more that I have a unique story. I'm a former carnival owner. I'm an amusement equipment broker. I'm a totally blind guy who doesn't understand the dangers of traveling by himself anywhere in the world if the opportunity comes along. I like to tell people I'm not smart enough to be scared, and some days, some days people correct me on that, and some days they don't. But I keep doing the next thing, and the next thing for me this week was word camp here in New York. The next thing after this is word camp in Pittsburgh. And after that, I really don't know what the next thing is because a lot of times people ask me that. It's my least favorite question. They ask me, what's next? What you going to do next? And I always tell them, I don't really know what I'm going to do next because I've found, I've found that uh, it's best if I don't put limits on God. I find that oftentimes his dreams are bigger than mine and sometimes his obstacles are bigger than mine. And oh, I like to tell people, he may give you a gift that says batteries included or some assembly required, but he will help you assemble it. Now, I think I'm a little short on time, I think I'm, but I think I'm getting close. But I think if it's okay with y'all, we'll go ahead and do some questions now. And please don't anybody raise their hand. Just go to the mic and we'll take whoever gets there first. Either we have described audio, we didn't even plan it. Um, first of all, I want to thank you because I'm working on a website for my brother who was blind. He was an artist and a sculptor and he died in March. And so I have been working, trying to put it up to end. All of my brothers and sisters who want his art to be seen by people, then here's the man who his eyesight had 17% acuity. Yeah. And it was like, he described it as looking at things through a straw. And the work that he did was incredible. So I want to thank you for encouraging me to get his website up and running. Right. One thing, yeah. One thing to remember about a website like that is, is when you're dealing with something where you're going to have a lot of images, a lot of art to describe and make sure it's rendered properly, there's nothing wrong with posting one item, you know, uh, one series. A lot of people, if they get in the middle of a project like that and they're like, well, when I get it all done, then I'll have it go live. But a lot of people are going to come back to the website or are going to find the website for the first time after you've started that process. Meanwhile, you're getting indexed in Google and other search engines, and people are starting to find out about the site. They're starting to bookmark the site. They're starting to talk about the site. And then by the time you get everything up there, those people who liked it are going to come back and look at the things they didn't see yet. Uh, well, we have this home page up. Good. Uh, and we were able to get uh, a small showing in San Diego, that's our hometown. So that's on the home page, so that people see a little bit of this stuff. And then you know, I'm working on the Metropolitan series. Which is Good. Of his so each time the case is finished, I kind of see that. That's great. You're, <coughs> well, I will say this. You're unusual because a lot of people still wouldn't be doing it in that process. You know, it, it, people get funny ideas in their heads when they're building a site like that. And I would say reach out to the people at the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind because they are very big on supporting projects like that. Yeah, the man you want to talk to is William Butler. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the ways I promote my podcast is by appearing on other people's radio shows and podcasts. Uh, because I find that they often have audiences I don't have and that many of their fans are royal supporters of their work and will support my site, visit the site, and share the site because 
their friend, the person that they listen to and, and, and like, has suggested they listen to me because I came on their show. That's, the, that's one of the top things I do. Beyond that, the usual social media stuff, which I hate. I especially hate Facebook because, in my opinion, it changes way too often for its own good. And I've, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. If I ever meet Zuckerberg in the street, he's going down. And I don't care who tells him. Because really, that site changes so much, so often, and most of the time for very little reason. See, even the sighted people agree with me on that. Okay. Hi, Max. It's Bud Kraus. Hey, and Bud. you know, we, you and I have had a chance to chat yesterday. And yeah. I'm going to say something that I normally don't say in public, but, uh, you know, I'm visually impaired and I don't see very well, and you know that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it's hard for me to even, you know, admit to that or say that publicly because, you know. but anyway, so thank you for coming. And um, I want you to, um, I took a trip this year around the United States and I went on 19 days around the country, um, you know, going on Amtrak. And it was difficult for a visually impaired person to do a trip like that. So you mentioned travel. And do you want to talk? I know this is not a WordPress question, but I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about some of the challenges and difficulties that you have navigating airports and stuff like that. So whatever sure. comes to your mind, please go ahead okay, and share. Yeah. All right. Well, as you know, <coughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm a big fan of Amtrak, uh, mainly because they allowed me to take my first real trip two years ago and in my opinion if you're blind and you're going to be traveling to cities and you're traveling there for conferences or speaking events usually via Amtrak you're going to end up closer to the event than you will if you take the plane that's for the most part and I find for me for me personally I find it harder to get from the train or the plane station to the venue or the hotel than I do to get from city to city so I prefer to end up as close to where I want to go as possible. For example, last week when I went to Philadelphia, um, there were some problems and I didn't end up doing it, but I could have taken a local train from the from the Philadelphia Amtrak station to within a couple of blocks of the hotel where I was going to be staying. Somebody who flew into the airport in the same city paid almost $50 to Uber. And if they paid that to Uber, they would have probably paid over 100 to a taxi. So me, as a blind person traveling, especially traveling solo without a wife, girlfriend, or paid assistant, I try to, to look at things in the overall way because traveling by train is more expensive than traveling by plane, but only if you can drive. If you can afford, you know, if you're in a position to drive a rental car when you get to town, then you have an advantage over me when it comes to making the schedule. So me, I would prefer to take the train. It's gonna be a little longer. It's gonna be a little more expensive. I also find the staff on the train uh, more attentive and friendlier than I have found the staff on the airplanes. And the final thing is I'm six foot four and a half inches tall, 270 pounds. I do not like cramming my butt into airplane seats. But once you get to the place where you're going, um, there's, a, there's a new app that's being tested in the San Francisco airport that will allow you, allow you to connect your, uh, your smartphone to a system of beacons that will allow you to navigate the entire airport. There's, uh, that same system is supposed to be in the process of being installed at Penn Station and Union Station here in, uh, in Grand Central City here in New York. And the reason they're doing it is because GPS doesn't work so well indoors, but they've found out that this beacon system can work. And the interesting thing is the tests that they've done on it in California, the sighted people are liking it even better than the blind people because they can go from wherever they are in the airport to wherever they need to go, including, you know, reservation desks, baggage pickup, and even finding the restroom much more easily. So they've been testing it there for a couple of years now, and I don't know why it hasn't gone more mainstream yet, but that's, um, I should mention that I'm kind of a low tech person. I have blind friends. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not the only blind blogger or podcaster, um, but, I have blind friends who are much more adept at the tech side of it, and they use their GPS more than I do. <clears throat> I was having a discussion with somebody earlier this morning about the, this whole idea of independence versus interdependence, and I know there are a lot of blind people who are uh, very passionate about their independence, and 
I tend to be on the other end of the scale and think that life is better the more that you interact with people and the more you allow people to be part of your story. So I'm not what you'd call a real uh, out there blind person when it comes to traveling. I would much rather get, get from here to there with a, uh, with, a, with a friendly word, a smile, a handshake, and asking nicely as opposed to depending on the tech because both can break down. You can be disappointed by people and tech equally. Hi, hi, Max. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, I appreciated your sharing your first um, website with us. That was very inspiring because <laughs> it was. It helped me because I'm one of those <coughs> perfectionists who gets stopped by, well, if it's not perfect, you know, it, yeah. doesn't, it, it doesn't exist. Um, but I'm just wondering, h how did you negotiate your first podcast? Like, what did you do in terms of equipment and, and that? Okay, well, my first radio show was done over the phone. My first podcast, as far as recording it, uh, we recorded it using Skype, and my friend Frederick recorded it on his end. Uh, since then, I have switched to using Zoom because Zoom has a built-in recording feature that Skype never offered. You had to purchase a third-party app to record your Skype conversations. And to me, I'm one of these in-the-moment kind of people. When I'm having an interview, I have to be focused on the conversation, not worrying about whether or not I'm being recorded or being broadcast or uh, are my sound levels good. You know, I'm kind of a press record, press stop kind of person. <coughs> and I like the fact that Zoom has keyboard commands for everything, like the woman who gave the accessibility talk was mentioning her, uh, yesterday. They have keyboard commands for everything, and in many cases, they have spoken word commands. And like I say, that record function where I can depend on it recording and just focus on the conversation is great. And of all the people I pay every month to keep myself online, the only person I don't complain about is Zoom. I don't mind that 16 bucks change I send them every month because it gives me so much peace of mind in return for it. And when you figure that after you record it, if you want, you can give somebody, say you can give the editor or you can give an assistant the link to where you recorded it. They can download it and post it for you. You can give that link to the person who was on the interview with you and they can download it to their website and have it in their library for future use. Um, the scheduling of meetings on Zoom used to be a little quirky, but it's gotten much better. And like WordPress, they have a sincere, total commitment to accessibility. So that's another reason. <clears throat> One thing I should mention to anybody who saw the talks on accessibility or who has been wondering about accessibility in general as, as a group, blind people are very loyal audiences, very loyal consumers. We will even overpay if we feel like the person providing the service or selling the product has real concern about our needs and desires. So when you go out of your way to make your site available to somebody who's blind or other people with disabilities, you're making it you're making it available for people that, if they like you, they're going to stay with you. They're going to tell other people to come see you. That's just the way we are as a group because there are so few people in the world who go out of their way to make us feel welcome like that, especially online. Did I answer your question? All right, thank you. Hi, I don't know if you already answered this because I came a little bit late, um, but you, can you recommend um, when we are, um, because I, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who do content, what would be uh, some ideas for, uh, for a site, you know, like the, how long you think is, is, is good for a content or how, how what, short? What kind of site do you have? Uh, <coughs> well, at the moment I'm, I'm designing one because I'm, I'm a, a um, freelance journalist. Okay. So I write a lot, so I don't know how much is too much or, or if I'm describing it uh, in a certain way. All right. When it comes to blog content, um, there really is no set length that's going to work. Some people do very well with 500 word posts. Some people do very well with 2,000 word posts. What it's about is finding a consistent length that you're comfortable for producing on a regular basis. I mean, if, if you can't sustain 2,500 word posts, then don't write 20, but if you can sustain that, then that'll become part of your brand. That'll become part of the reason why people visit your site and why they read your work. Just remember that if you're going to write long posts, you need to break it up with headers, links, photos, videos, uh, paragraph breaks, blank space. Just break it up really good if you're gonna write long posts. And then one other thing about length, 
I have a good friend named Ryan Vidal. He's known as the blogger from Paradise. And he used to write really long posts, um, over 2,000, sometimes over 5,000 words. And he finally decided that the smart thing to do was to stop writing long posts and start writing ebooks. So at some point, you have to ask yourself, are you giving people so much of yourself that you really should be charging them in the form of an ebook, or you should be creating an ebook and exchanging it for email addresses or something along those lines? So just ask yourself, what can you do on a weekly basis? How many posts can you write? How many words would those posts be? And what is sustainable? And when you take that in, take into, into account whatever your current schedule is, and then leave some, leave some extra time for fun or for things to not go the way you expected them to go. My doctor, one of my doctors says, Max, when you feel like working, work your butt off. When you don't feel like it, rest, do something fun, or sleep. Yeah, I like him, he's a good doctor. He doesn't yell. He doesn't yell about yell at me about anything. He's one of those guys who thinks that a positive approach to life is very important to stay healthy. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I hope that helps. I know figuring out uh, interval, the interval between posts and the length of posts is a hard thing to do. And the one thing I would say that I'm totally against is daily posting, unless you're just going to write really short posts. Any more questions? Sure. Yeah. All right. I would say think about the importance of the image. What is the image trying to convey and what are you hoping to get out of the image? Because if that image is attached to a link and the goal is to get me to buy something from you, then I want a lot of alt text. If that image is your header image and I'm going to see it often, I really don't want or need as much alt text. So I would say that's a good place to start. As far as description, um, I think that since there are varying levels of vision acuity, you should include colors. But I would avoid vague terms like hunk, chunk, lot, you know. Try to use specific terms, uh, even amounts, weights, uh, distances, if, they're, if they apply to the picture that you're describing. So <coughs> I would say that I personally, I like, a, I like a good amount of alt text, especially if it's a complicated image or, like I say, if the image is tied to you wanting me to buy something from you. Now, one thing I did just did just I did just remember, and I hope nobody's doing this. Facebook has recently started doing image recognition, where they will tell the screen readers what the image is. Now, there are three problems with that. One, sometimes Facebook can't determine the image at all, and it will tell you no text available. Two, it will describe the image, and the description is nowhere near specific enough. Um, my favorite one recently was, it said one person eating a plate of Mexican food. It didn't tell me, are we talking tacos or tamales or enchiladas or... And I would have liked to have known that because, you know, to me there's a difference. To me there's a difference. And the third problem with it is, is I'm afraid, I'm really afraid that webmasters and blog owners are going to start dropping the alt tag, because, especially when they post to social media, because they feel like they can depend on Facebook and other social media platforms to, to bail them out on that. That I am really afraid of that happening. And with the new uh, image recognition on the iPhones and the other iOS devices, I'm kind of worried about it happening there too. And one other thing about, all the, about alt tags that I don't know that anybody's talked about this week, the best thing about alt tag is not only does it help the blind, but it also helps the search engine find your photo. So don't forget that alt tag isn't just a penalty. It isn't just a burden you do for people like me. It's, it's something you do so Google and Yahoo and those people can find your website and send people to it. And I find once I put it that way to most website owners, they're like, it can drive traffic, we're going to do it.
Well, I've, I've seen people who do hour-long podcasts or two-hour-long radio shows that do just fine. I've seen, I've seen people who do 15-minute podcasts that are great. I've, seen, I've heard of podcasts that go an hour and they, they start tracking their stats and they notice nobody's listening past the first 15 minutes. It, a lot of it depends on the, the personality of the host and the guest, the subject matter, the audience. And one of the things you can do is you can try different links. You can uh, follow your, your stats on whatever podcasting platform you're using. And you can see what is it that people like. You can also use your email list to re reach out to people and go, we've been thinking that an hour might be too long or that every five days a week is too often or that once a month might be good enough. And you ask them, what, what do they need? What do they want? My show lasts about an hour depending on the guest, because some guests are great guests, like me, that answer questions far beyond the question that was asked, and fill time for hosts, which is one of the reasons why I keep getting booked, I think. And there are other guests who every answer is three words or less, and you spend the whole time wondering, when is this going to end? So it depends a lot on the guest, the host, and I would say that in general, unless you're doing a, a radio broadcast, which is you know, I know most of the radio is online radio now and it's archived so it can be listened to on demand. But in my opinion, if you're doing something that's going out live, then you can go longer and out longer than an hour and have it work for you. Uh, but I don't know of a whole lot of shows, radio or podcasts, that go more than 60 minutes. So I would say that's probably the top end of the ideal one. Uh, well, I, I recently stopped posting my audio because it was getting to be too much of an aggravation to go through the steps of getting my audio out on a podcasting platform. Um, I've since decided that I'm going to hire a virtual assistant to do that for me, and so we're going to get it back out on. Um, I use a platform called Podomatic, which is a pretty, a pretty respectable free platform. Um, I get a lot of grief for this, but I use the, vi the video camera and the microphone built into my laptop or built into the iPhone or the iPad. In most cases, the video and audio quality is just fine, especially for podcasting. The real question is, is lighting, uh, keeping your image and the image of your guests in focus, sound quality based on the equipment you do have, because I've recorded some great shows using a Plantronics 2468, which is by no means top of the line equipment. I recently won a Audio Technica ATR2100, and I'm actually looking forward to recording my first podcast with a real microphone. And <clears throat> I can't tell you how many times last week I would tell somebody, they'd ask me, well, how do you record your show? And I'm like, the built-in equipment? And they would look at me like, man, there's something wrong with you. I felt, you know, I don't usually feel awkward or less than other people. I usually feel like if they're farther along in their journey, that's fine. If they do things different than me, that's fine. But it's one of the few areas where I felt like, you know, they're, they're basically saying, Max, we can't believe you're trying to do a good podcast and get yourself out there and you're using the built-in microphone off of a five-year-old MacBook. Uh, so I would say if you can afford the equipment, that's fine, but there's no reason to have it, especially when you're starting out. You know, there, I'm sure many of y'all have seen sitcom episodes where parents have that conversation with their kids about them wanting to play soccer or learn the guitar, and they're like, let's find out if you like it before we spend any real money. I would say do the same thing with your podcasting. Find out if you like it. Are you going to be able to sustain it before you invest any money in expensive equipment? Because you can get started. You can develop an audience with the equipment you probably already own. The real key is if you're going to do video, look at your lighting. If you're not sure that you know what looks good as far as lighting goes, then have somebody look at it for you. Record a sample video and post it on your social media and go, hey, if I did this in this lighting, what would you think? And I, of course, I really should have done that myself, but I didn't. I was so happy that I was in focus. I didn't care if the lights were on or not. Because that is one of the things I worry about. One of my recent most fun podcast interviews, I was interviewing a blind author who's just as blind as I am. So we basically just said, if we're in focus, fine. If we're not in focus, fine. We're just going to go ahead and have our interview. And 
And the funny thing is, there again, people were like, we're so impressed that two blind people would use a visual medium like like a, like posting a YouTube video. So um, I would say the, the other thing is check your audio and make sure because people will t people can turn your volume down, but they cannot turn your volume up beyond a certain point. And I can't tell you how many times I have quit a video because it was either too soft or it was too loud and there wasn't an obvious way for me to turn the volume down. I mean, sometimes as, as a blind person, you get stuck in that loop, trying to hear through the music and try to find those quiet spots in a rock tune so you can find that button to turn it off. Yeah. That's all the okay, so I'm down to, she's telling me I'm down to two minutes, right? Yeah, okay. Oh, oh quickly, Max, hello. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, I would, just wanted to say that uh, starting out in uh, blogs or social media, you know, trying to establish oneself is sometimes that I'm exhausted. It's more, you know, fear is added to it, but exhaustion is also there. Um, so when you started out, you said you started out with your website, which is pretty good if I started yeah. out. So, yeah. and then from there you sort of uh, in, from there I started. Right. Yeah, I added the blog and the social media and the email list. I would say do what I recently did: <laughs> evaluate everything you're doing for your blog and find out things that you're doing because other people say you should do them. Right. There could be things in there that you're doing that don't serve your purpose at all and that right. are wearing you out. That's, that was right. my problem with the audio from my interview. Right. So, yeah. I, right, I want to be a lifestyle blogger and then people say, oh, go to YouTube and then you have your uh, Instagram account and uh, no, podcast. Right. Yeah. Well, I wasn't on six social media networks all at once. I started with Facebook and then moved to LinkedIn and then to Twitter. And that's the way you have to do it. You have to find one thing and do it well for a while and then see if you have time to do other things. I hope you can put me on your show one day. Thank you. Well, <laughs> go to, go to theblindblogger.net and send me an email and remind me who you are. And we will uh, we'll see if maybe knowing that you could be a guest on my show will get you to the point where you either post your blog or post more, more often from it. So Zuli Rodriguez at WordPress, uh, right. WordPress Camp 2018. Thank you. Yay. I got yeah. my friend. <coughs> Okay, I appreciate it. Um, I hope that I hope that in my own way I have uh, inspired some of y'all to either post for the first time or post more often or share more openly. And while I don't feel good, I'm going to try to end this the way I the way I thought about it in my mind before I came up here. I want y'all to listen to these next words and think about them as you leave or as you hear the next speaker. Too many times we stand aside. And let the water slip away To what we put off to tomorrow Has finally come today So don't stand upon the shoreline And say you're satisfied Choose to chance the rapids Dare to dance the tide That's all you're going to get today Because that's all my voice will... Yeah.